All right, it is 6.30. I'm just I'm waiting until our live stream goes live as well, which goes live at 6.30. So that's why we start, uh, gonna start, try to start right on time. A uh, couple of housekeeping things as, as we get going. Uh, first of all, on October 14th, you're going to see that we do not have uh, a Bible study that night, so that will be a, uh, a Monday night that we won't have anything. Um, Jim and Elaine are leaving on a cruise, and we're going to just, you know, be in mourning for them. So, no, I am actually going to be out of town on the 14th, so I'm not going to be able to be here uh, that evening. So I know just, uh, I don't know, put it in your phone so you remind yourself. We'll try to make an announcement as well and put it in the bulletin, let you know it that way or on the app. But if you just want to put a reminder in your phone, that would be really helpful as well so that you're not showing up here on the 14th and uh, and, and then just sad and disappointed because you don't get to see, uh, get to see me that night. Um, I'm kidding. I, I jest, by the way. Uh, another thing I want to let you know about is that um, I, we had originally announced in the bulletin, 6.30 to 8. That was just to give a little bit of a uh, of a extra time in case wanted to go longer. But really, at 6.30 to 7.30, that's what time this um, Bible study is going to meet. And I'll, I, I try to wrap it up around the 7.30 time. I may go a little bit over from time to time. Uh, usually about an hour of talking is, is uh, my voice is starting to wear out. And I start to see people's eyes glaze over a little bit as well. So hopefully an hour will keep you engaged and somewhat um, into the things that we're talking about. So that's a couple of housekeeping things. Let's pray and let's get into the word of God here this evening. Father, thank you for this group of people who are genuinely wanting to know what your word says, not what any other person says. They want to know what your word has to say about the end times. Lord, as we read your word, we can draw conclusions based upon what your word says. Help us to lay aside any preconceived ideas, any outside thinking that we try to do, and just listen to the Holy Spirit, listen to what your word has to say. I pray tonight, Lord, as we get into the book of Daniel, that you'll show us the things that we need to hear from you. Be in this place. I pray, Lord, for the, just these world events that are happening, that you would protect your, your disciple, that those that claim Jesus following you, that, Lord, we would receive your protection, your help, and your, your leading through all that we are going to witness. Father, be with us now. Teach us now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. If you have a Bible with you, uh, turn to uh, Daniel chapter 7. Uh, that's where we want to pick it up for tonight and the things that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, let me give you a quick recap of what we have talked about. We've talked about the four timelines that are in the Bible. Now, the timelines are not always sequential. They kind of lay on top of the other. They provide some layering, and some of the timelines give indication about things that are said elsewhere, and it starts to all make sense. It comes together as we begin to wrestle with it and we begin to layer it. And again, we're not trying to layer our own preconceived ideas, all we want to know is what the word of God says and let that be our guide. So we have the nation of Israel. That is out of the book of Ezekiel. We have been looking at that. Um, we also have the Antichrist and the beastly empire. Primarily in the book of Daniel, it lays out this. Who is, who is the enemy of God? What's this going to look like? Number three, the church and Christians that Jesus is going to lay out in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. And then the heavenly perspective is God is looking down from heaven in the book of Revelation. Now you're going to see, and I'm even going to show you this tonight, that there's a lot of verses out of other sections that really amplify the things that we talk about out of the book of Daniel. We're going to see out of the book of Daniel things are going to be said, and it's going to match up with what is being said in the book of Revelation. But let me give you a quick recap of what we saw on the nation of Israel. We saw that God said Israel, for the end times to take effect, Israel has to be reborn. 
is asked to come back to life. It was gone, it was dead, it was just in ruins, it was desolated for about 2,000 years, 1900, and it came back to life. And God says, that's what's going to happen. When Israel comes back to life, it's not going to be two nations like it was before. Israel and Judah it was split into two kingdoms from the time of the death of Solomon. It was split into two kingdoms. Jesus, when he was there, it was two kingdoms in the nation of Israel. But God had warned it's going to come back and it's going to be one. That's what it is today. Nations will rise against Israel. That's what it said in the book of Ezekiel, that Israel's reborn, and nations will come against Israel. And we've seen that, and we see that all the time. The United Nations has more sanctions against the nation of Israel. There's more animosity and hatred toward the nation of Israel than any other nation in the world, and that's what it says. Nations will rise. These nations will rise, according to Ezekiel, at what was called the end of days. That is a reference to the end times. Israel will experience a peace and a letting down of their guard before the end. Now, one of the things that I didn't cover in the book of Ezekiel, we'll cover later, is the next chapters that I didn't read. You can go and read it for yourself. There is a talk about a temple. The temple will be reborn. It will be rebuilt in the nation of Israel, and they will implement temple worship once again, because that sets the stage for all of these things to happen. So the temple comes into being. And when Jesus returns, it talks about him entering in through the gates, entering in through the temple. Israel will experience a peace. They're going to let their guard down at some point. Some proclamation, some agreement, false agreement happen across the Middle East where Israel will let their guard down. At that moment, that's when the end will come. Now, not all of the Middle Eastern nations will join and be a part of this, but a lot of them will. It will be this axis of nations. That's what we're going to see tonight. We're going to start seeing that. Then... When all of this happens, the temple has been rebuilt, Israel is reestablished, they've let their guard down, that's when this end will come with a great force coming against Israel. That's the key. That is the, the timepiece, the clock for all of the events that happen. And finally, it says that when these things happen, God will vindicate Israel. In other words, he is going to turn and set things right, and he will destroy this axis of nations that are coming. Now, what we saw before was this was kind of that picture, potentially, of those nations, because this is what the areas are geographically that the Bible talks about. It uses the old terms, but if you overlay those, that's where these nations potentially could be coming out of. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7 is the culmination event, and that is the, what's called Jacob's trouble. It's the great day of trouble. Jeremiah 30 verse 7 says, alas, that day is so great, that day of trouble, when all of these nations come against it, when this attack happens, it is a time of distress for Jacob, yet he shall be saved out of it. Now the word Jacob is a reference to Israel. Jacob was the patriarch of the 12 sons, became the 12 tribes of Israel, and Jacob's name was changed from Jacob to Israel. So what is he saying? Israel will undergo a time of distress unlike anything it's ever seen in its history. It will be Jacob's trouble, Jacob's day of distress, and yet it will be saved because God will vindicate so it becomes the central point and the central location of all that is happening. Now, last week, we started looking at, okay, who does the Bible say or what is this picture of what this beastly empire that will come against Israel at the end times, what does that look like? What is it? In the book of Daniel, we get the pictures. Daniel lays out the pictures of what the beastly empire and the Antichrist system is. And Daniel does this through a variety of visions that he is going to have. 
Daniel has these incredible visions. He's seeing these things happen, and he's not able to comprehend it all. He, he's not able to describe it all. Not all of it makes sense. But, Jake, but, but Daniel is trying the best that he can to describe what he sees to us so that we can make some conclusions or we can at least learn some things about what is going to happen in the end. Well, he starts off, the very first thing he gives is out of chapter 2, verses 31 through 45. We talked about this last week. And he gives the very first vision is the vision of a statue. Now, if you remember, the vision of the statue was this. Daniel said, or, or the king had this dream and Daniel interpreted it. Later, Daniel's the ones going to have the dreams and the visions. But Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And he saw a statue. And these statues, this statue had all kinds of different metals in it. There were four primary and then a fifth one that was part of it. You can see a picture on the screen. The gold part of the statue. You had the silver part. You had a bronze piece. You had an iron piece of the statue. And then you had a kind of a combination of iron and clay. So it's really kind of four, but it's described as a, like a 4A. That's the final one, a 4A. It's connected to the original one. What were these kingdoms? Well, Daniel described it. He said the first kingdom is you, Nebuchadnezzar. It is Babylon. You are the head. You are the gold. You are the premier empire that is here. At the time of Daniel, the Babylonian empire was incredibly great. It looks something like this. Now, the Mediterranean Sea on the left, the middle left of the screen, is going to be prominent in all of these. And I want you to kind of lock that in your mind because that's important, this idea of the Mediterranean Sea. The Babylonian Empire stretched through the Middle East, up into Turkey, down into Africa, into Egypt, going further south into Saudi Arabia. This was the Babylonian Empire, and this was the head of gold. So he says, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the gold part of the statue. At the end of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, after he died, after his son lost the kingdom, he lost it to the Medes and the Persians. That was a joint empire, the Medes and the Persians. The Persians had a little bit more power and weight than the Medes did, but it was a combined empire. And the empire of silver, not quite as magnificent as the gold, took over from the head of gold. And the Mediterranean uh, area plays a prominent role again. You see right there, it's a picture of the Medo-Persian Empire stretched from Egypt in Africa up through the Middle East into Turkey, almost over into Greece around the Mediterranean Sea. This silver empire, impressive, but not quite to the level of the Babylonian Empire. Now, Daniel would have seen the evidence of Nebuchadnezzar, and he would have been seeing the rise of the Medes and the Persians, who came in and took over. What was the next one? Well, it was the part of brass or bronze. The part of bronze is a picture of Greece. The next empire, the next world empire that took over was the Greek empire. And this is a picture of Alexander the Great and the empire that he had following the Medes and the Persians. And where was it again? Well, Egypt, the Middle East, even stretching further to the east, up into Turkey, up into Greece, around the Mediterranean Sea. This next empire was an empire of bronze, and he had incredible things that he was doing. We're going to talk more about that today. That empire lost to the next empire, which was the empire of Rome. And Rome was the picture of iron. The Roman Empire was known as this iron empire. The technology advances that they had in the time of the Roman Empire were great compared to the empires of Alexander the Great and his sons that took over from him. And they were the next empire. And their empire stretched, again, amazingly, around the Mediterranean Sea. And their empire was Western and Eastern. 
The Western Empire was what we know as much of Europe today, it's part of Africa, and the Eastern Empire stretching into the Middle East, up into Turkey, up into Greece, down into Africa, and that was the location of the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire, the first half of that, ceased to be in existence around 476 AD. So the Western Empire was gone, but the Eastern Empire kept going until the 1400s. A little before the 1400s, that's when the Ottoman Empire, the Muslim Empire of that time took over from the Romans, and they became the next big Middle Eastern Empire. And so you have iron, what happened next? Well, there is this, what is called a prophetic gap. And the prophetic gap is because this hasn't happened yet. Now, I want you to think of this picture, the iron and the clay. That's a picture of the strength or the location of the Roman Empire, in particular the Eastern Roman Empire, but it was mixed with clay. It doesn't meld quite as nicely. There's a lot of humanity kind of things in it that there's a lot of, there's not as much strength as there was before. This empire, think of the feet, has 10 toes. Let's just say a person with 11 toes. I don't know if anybody has 11 toes in here. You probably don't want to admit it if that's something that you're dealing with. Anyway, 10 toes of the statue and it represents something that's going to be profound. It's going to represent this 10 kingdoms that are going to come together. Well, it says after he saw this statue that when this one, which was called and has been termed a revived Roman Empire, when this revives in the future, Daniel says, and then he saw a stone, not taken with human hands, carved really by God himself, and it was God that threw down and smashed the feet, this final kingdom, destroyed it, and brought his kingdom in completely. So that is the first vision that Daniel didn't have. It was the King Nebuchadnezzar he had, but it's going to match the next vision that Daniel is going to have personally. And that's where we're going to turn to chapter 7. And in chapter 7, we are going to see Daniel have a vision. Now, this vision that Daniel has is pretty amazing. And there's some things that I want you to understand about the book of Daniel. Daniel is a hard book to read. It doesn't make sense. It can be confusing at times. And so it's important as we walk through this to, to wrestle with the things that are found in it. If you read it on its face, it's going to be like, I don't understand a thing as to what it's saying. But if you start digging into it, it starts to make sense. And you can kind of see the picture unfolding in your mind. Let's talk a little bit about Daniel. Daniel was an incredible guy, knew the Lord, walked closely with the Lord, a man of godliness, a man of character, a man who saw things from God, received revelation from God, was a mouthpiece for God, an incredible man of God. In the book of Daniel, it's kind of confusing because the chapters are not linear in many ways. Chapters one through six describe the life and the times of Daniel. Chapters 7 through 12 describe all of the visions that Daniel had. Daniel chapter 7 took place during a time between Daniel chapters 4 and 5. So 1 through 6 are the life and times of Daniel. 7 through 12 are all of his visions. Chapter 7 really falls in between chapters 4 and 5. Does that make sense? That's kind of the way that it's laid out. So sometimes it's hard. We, we read things linearly, but it's not like that in this book. Okay, let's talk about the vision that he had. Daniel had a dream. He had visions. The first one is described in Daniel chapter 7. This was the most comprehensive. The other three visions go into greater detail uh, within the general framework of the very first vision that he has. So he's going to tell this vision. Let's read it together. Here's what he says. In the first year 
of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Now, now who's Belshazzar? He is the son of Nebuchadnezzar. He is the one that's going to lose his kingdom to Cyrus in the Medes and the Persians. They're going to come in and take it over. But Belshazzar was the king at the time. Belshazzar is the one who saw the writing on the wall. You remember the story, the handwriting on the wall? It's a couple of chapters back. And that is the one who saw this, who would lose his kingdom. So Daniel is having a vision, and it's going back a little bit in the book. In the first year of Belshazzar, that's when Daniel saw this dream. And he had this vision in his head as he lay in his bed. And then he wrote down the dream and told, notice these words. He says, he told the sum of the matter. What is the sum of the matter? Well, that means the summary of the dream, or it means the telling of the main facts. That's what he was doing. You ever had a dream? Or, you know, yeah, maybe it's a dream. You you slept at night, you had a really crazy dream, and you get up and you try to recall it, and you can't really recall it very well, and somebody asks about it, and you try to tell them, and you tell them kind of the main points from the dream, but there were so many other details. Well, that's kind of what Daniel is doing. He's giving the summary statement. In fact, he gave it all, it would be incredibly long, and it would be hard to follow maybe some of it. What it means is this, that God doesn't give all the detail. He gives what he wants us to know. The rest of it, we've either got to figure it or we've got to have faith and trust him in the midst of it. He gives us the main facts, the points that we need to, the summary statement, the big heading. And that's what Daniel was doing. I'm going to tell you the sum of the matter, he says. Daniel declared, he said this, I saw in my vision by night... And behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Now, remember when I said, I want you to kind of lock your thought in your mind about the Mediterranean Sea? That's exactly what Daniel was saying. He saw in his mind the great sea. In ancient Middle East, ancient Israel, the Mediterranean was the sea. It was the source of everything. They didn't look to the south. They didn't go beyond those borders. The Mediterranean was the great sea. That's why all of these events happen around Israel because this is what they saw. It was happening here. This is where the conflict is. He didn't see Hawaii. He didn't see Australia. He saw the great sea here. And that's what he says. He says, I saw the four winds of heaven and they were stirring up the great sea. The Mediterranean and Israel is the center of the prophetic earth. Every one of the nations that we saw before that were of these great, these great empires, they all had their lands touching the sea. And that's what it was referring to. Now, Every four beasts that we're going to see, they all had a connection there. Additionally, the sea is sometimes connected to the Gentile nations. In Psalm 74, Psalm 89, Isaiah 57, the sea was always connected to the Gentile world. And so that's what Daniel's saying. I saw the four winds and they were stirring up the great sea. What are the four winds? Well, the four winds are mentioned in Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. And what are those four winds? It's a picture of really satanic forces. So the four winds, the satanic forces that are coming from the corners, the four winds. And it says in Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, listen to this. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or against any tree. So what was happening? The satanic forces that are coming, the angels are holding them back, holding them at bay, not releasing them and letting them do what they're going to do. So Daniel says, I saw the four winds, referring to the satanic influence, the satanic forces of the world. 
Now, he also says this, and I saw four great beasts come up out of the sea different from one another. So we saw four beasts. So what did we see before? Well, in the statue, there are four kingdoms and a four A, a restoration, a revived empire. Well, what's he going to say now? Well, now I see four beasts. So what are these four beasts that he sees? Well, here's the first one it says. The first was like a lion, and it had eagle's wings. And then I looked, and its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. What does that mean? Well, a lion and an eagle are two of the most majestic creatures known. They are represented around the world and in scripture as majestic. Did you know that the nation of Babylon, the gold part of the head, was often referred to in this way? That it was like a lion with wings. Did you know that you can also go to the British Museum today and you could see Babylonian winged lions in the museum? They're not real, by the way, just so you know. They're just statues that are there. But he says it is something like an eagle-lion combination. I saw this beast come up, and it was different, and it had eagle's wings. But then the eagle's wings were plucked off, and it went to the ground, and it stood on two feet like a man, and the man of a mine was given to it. No, no, what is this a reference to? You remember Nebuchadnezzar? He had a God complex, and then God humbled him greatly. And he came to a point that it seemed like humility and repentance took over. That was the picture of what happens here. It was the eagle with, or the lion with eagle's wings that were plucked off, and now it was walking like a man, and now it had a mind, now it had a heart. Something had greatly changed in this, in this beast. It, it's a, it's a human-like uh, status that reflects this deliverance that happened. In the book of Jeremiah, the lion and the eagle are pictures that Jeremiah refers to of Nebuchadnezzar. In Jeremiah chapter 49. So that's the picture that he sees first. He says, the first thing I saw was a lion and it had eagle's wings. Okay? Well, that's the first beast. And I looked and the wings were plucked off, lifted from the ground. He got two feet, got the mind of a man. That was the first beast. Here's the second beast. He says, the second beast that he saw is this. Another. The second one was like a bear. And it was raised up on one side and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, arise and devour much flesh. Well, what is the bear? Well, the bear was a symbol of the next empire. Remember, the next one on the list was silver, and that was the empire of the Medes and the Persians. That was the bear. The bear is very different from an eagle and a lion. The bear is not as majestic. It is slower, but it's stronger. And it's more crushing. It's more voracious in its appetite. It's more consuming for conquest. And that's exactly what happened here. Now it says that this bear was raised up on one side more than the other side, which shows the dominance of the one part of the empire, the Persian part of the empire, over the Mede part of the empire. And it had three ribs in its mouth. Well, why would that matter? Well, because the Medes and the Persians conquered three primary nations, Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. And so he says the next empire is the Medes and the Persians. And the first was Babylon. And then he saw the third beast coming up out of the ground. And he says, after I looked, behold, there was another but this one was like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. Well, what is the leopard talking about? What is the leopard's part of this? Well, the leopard was exactly the picture 
of what the Greek empire of Alexander the Great was going to be. The leper was known for its sudden, unexpected attacks. It was swift. It had four wings, it says. It was very swift. It was clever. It had four heads. Every animal was mighty. This one was more stealthy, more stunning, and it would spring upon its prey. And that's exactly what happened in Alexander the Great's empire. Incredibly, by the age of 28, he had taken over much of what was the known world. He had taken over this. And it says that this leopard had four heads. Well, what's that a reference to? Well, when Alexander the Great died, his four sons, who was Cassander, uh, I don't remember how to pronounce all of their names, Lysimachus, uh, Seleucus, and Ptolemy, all four of them inherited what he had had, and they basically ruined the empire that was given to them. And so that was the fourth beast. It was the fourth head. It was the leopard compared to the bronze. Well, then he has another one. And he says this, after this, I, I saw a fourth beast. And the fourth beast was terrifying. And it was dreadful. And it was exceedingly strong. And it had great iron teeth. And it devoured and broke into pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. Well, that sounds much like what happened in Rome. And the Roman Empire, this fourth beast and this fourth beast was iron and it trampled and it devoured and it broke into pieces and that's exactly what happened in the Roman Empire it devoured and it broke into pieces and it trampled everything around them and here's the problem with it that fourth beast it says it was different there was something different about this because the fourth beast is going to be the one who revives. There is a reviving of the fourth beast that happens, a reviving of the Roman Empire. Now, as the statue had 10 toes, this one doesn't have 10 toes. It has what? It has 10 horns. And what is the picture of 10 horns? It is the picture of this beast empire that is going to come up. It says, it had ten horns. Now, Daniel says, I, I considered the horns, and behold, in the ten horns, there came up something else. Of the ten horns, there came up a different one called a little horn. And what was significant about this little horn that came out of the ten other horns that was there? Well, here's what he says. The little horn came up among them before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. The ten horns represent ten kingdoms. Or you could say ten nations. Ten nations. Of the ten, three were just absolutely obliterated by this little horn. This little horn rises up and it unroots three of the nations. And this little horn were in it the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So this is a human with eyes, with power, with a voice speaking great things. Now, the Bible is going to say even more about what it's speaking, but that's exactly what is happening. This little horn that raises up that is different. Now, who is this little horn? This is the Antichrist. The Antichrist is the one that rises up amongst the ten horns, displaces three of them, takes over the empire, is human, has power, and a voice that is powerful, speaking incredible things. That sounds kind of like what we have heard about the Antichrist being. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 3, here's what it says. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, there was a great red dragon. What is this great red dra dragon? Well, this great red dragon is the beastly empire. 
It's not a literal dragon that they're riding around on. It is a reference to this satanic conglomeration of nations that has seven heads, that has ten horns, and on his seven heads, there are seven royal crowns called diadems. So what does that mean? It means there were ten, but there are really seven because three of them have been taken down, and this is that beastly empire that has the crown, that is creating this, that is doing this. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, here's what John writes. I saw a beast rising out of the sea. Does that sound like what Daniel saw? I saw these, these four beasts coming out. I saw a beast rising out of the sea. Guess what it had? Ten horns. And it had seven heads. And it had ten royal crowns on its horns. And blasphemous names on its heads. What, what is blasphemous? That's anti-God language. Anti-God words. Anti-God speech. So here's what he's saying. There is an empire that will rise up coming against God's people that we saw in the book of Ezekiel, and it will be made up of 10 nations, 10 kingdoms. And all of these 10 nations, these 10 kingdoms come together, and a little horn, what is, what is little? It means insignificant, rises up, takes out three of them, takes power over the rest of them. They're going to bow down to him. And he's going to lead this empire. Let's go back to what Daniel says. As I looked, he says this, thrones were placed. So now he's switching from these beasts. Now he is switching to the throne room in heaven. What is God's response to this? Well, here's what he says. I looked and there were thrones that were placed and the Ancient of Days took his seat. What is, what is the Ancient of Days? Well, it's God Almighty. That is the Father God. The Father God is, is the one who is there. The thrones are there, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Now, his clothing was as white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. And his throne was fiery flames. Do you know that when John saw his revelation in heaven, he also saw thrones? And he saw people seated on the thrones. At that time, he saw 24 elders seated on the thrones. But Daniel doesn't see any. I think it's probably because the church wasn't in existence yet at this time. And at that time, those 24 elders represent the church. Because that's what it says. So he sees the throne. He sees the ancient of days. His hair was as white as snow. His throne was fiery flames. It was ablaze with fire. Now what is this? Well, this is a, the brilliant manifestation of God himself. God's splendor. God's fierce heat. God's judgment. There, there's something like this stream of fire that is pouring out of the throne of God. You know, every time we're tempted to remember or to think, well, God is just my buddy. He, he's just my, he's my friend, which there's some truth. We are the friend of God, it says. But it's also good to remember that this is God. Seated on the throne, fire pouring out, judgment coming. It was a brilliant manifestation of God's splendor as Daniel was beginning to see it. In Isaiah chapter 66, verses 15 and 16, it describes the judgment of God in terms of fire, destructive power. And it says that the Lord will come with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword, the Lord will judge all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. And so this is God. We see God. He's right here. Fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. Now in that day, most kings 
thrones did have wheels on them, kind of like chariots did. In many ways, it's just representing the endless activity of an omnipotent, omnipresent God that is right there. And then look what it says. A stream of fire issued, that's judgment, and it came out from before the Ancient of Days, God. There were a thousand thousands that served him, and there were 10,000 times 10,000 who stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. What are the books that are opened? You know, the Bible describes three different kinds of books. In Psalm chapter 69, it describes the book of the living. In Malachi chapter 3, it describes the book of remembrance. And in Philippians and in Revelation, multiple places in Revelation, it describes the book of life. And so God is there and the books are open and thousands of people are standing before him. You know, in in the book of Romans, it says that we are without excuse. You you know what that's going to mean? It means that we are all going to stand before God, and we're not going to be able to say to God, well, I I didn't know. I had no idea. I had no clue. I never heard of, this is the first time I'm hearing of this, God. If you would have just told me, I would have, I would have definitely changed my ways. No, the People are going to stand before God. The court is going to be open. The books are going to be open. And that's what Daniel is seeing. When does that happen? It happens at the end. When we stand before the great white throne of God, the great white throne judgment that begins to happen. So Daniel goes from the beasts into the throne room. He sees the Ancient of Days, his clothing, his hair, his throne, the people before him, the judgment that's going to happen. In Matthew 28 and in Revelation 1, here's what he says about God. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. So what is that saying? Well, there's consistency. Daniel saw the exact same thing that Jesus describes. It's the exact same thing that John will see. This is the throne room. And this is what they are experiencing. Let's go on in the throne room. And here's what he says about the throne room. As I looked, thrones were placed. And the Ancient of Days took a seat. You know, it's an interesting thing. I don't want to get into the weeds, and I don't want to get into a side note, but the question always seems to come up is, who in the world are on these thrones? I thought God was God alone. Well, we'll cover that some other time, okay? (laughs) We'll, We'll look at that some other time later, because I don't want to get in the weeds. I looked, the thrones were placed. The Ancient of Days took a seat. His clothing was white as snow, and his hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, his wheels burning fire. Stream of fire issued, came out from before him. I think I just already read most of that. Okay, books were open. I looked, then because the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season at a time. So now he's going back. He's saying, okay, this fourth beast that we were just starting to begin to understand or look at, now they're gone. God has wiped them out. The dominion that they had has now been replaced by the dominion of the king. And here's what he says is the dominion of the king. We're going to come all back to this. Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, With the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. So who's that? That is Jesus on the scene. Jesus is now on the scene. Ancient of days, that's the father. Now you have the son of man, that is Jesus. And Jesus came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to Jesus was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. 
that all the peoples, all the nations, and all the languages should serve him. That all, uh, that his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So here's, here's the scene. I got too much to erase. Uh, here, here is the scene that he has. All right, too much to erase. I don't have time to do this. Okay, here's the, here's the picture. The timeline is this. The beastly empire rises. As the beastly empire rises and has its way and does its worst, that's when the Ancient of Days sends his son, the son of man. How does he come? The clouds of heaven. Have you heard that phrase before? Jesus coming on the clouds of heaven? Well, it says it in Matthew. It says it in the book of Acts. It talks about it in the book of Revelation. The son of man comes down and basically wipes this empire out. And then what happens? Jesus sets up his dominion and his reign and it will not come to a dominion. That looks right. Uh, comes His dominion and his reign goes on everlasting from that moment. That's what happens at, at the very end. The millennial reign of Jesus enters in and it sets up shop forever. Okay. Now, Daniel is going to say, what in the world did I just see? I, I'm not quite sure what I just see. Let's, let's see if we can understand it. So Daniel says this. He says, as for me, uh, my spirit, when I saw this, uh, was a little bit anxious. Can you imagine if you're in that time and you're seeing future events in a vision, a nightmarish vision, how much anxiety you would feel about the future? He doesn't know when it's going to happen. He doesn't know how long. Is it next week? Is it next year? Is it 10 years from now? I don't know what I just saw. I cannot put words. Can you imagine Daniel being several hundred years before Christ, which would probably put him in the neighborhood of maybe 2,500, 2,600 years ago today? What if Daniel had seen visions of what our world looks like today? Imagine if he saw a military conquest of things coming out, destroyers, cruise missiles, F-16s, raptors coming in, helicopters flying, tanks covering a battlefield. Can you imagine? How would he describe that, having never seen anything like that? See, in many ways, he's describing what he says is uh, a beast, without really understanding what in the world he's seeing or able to put words to what he's say, seeing. And so he says, I, I, I feel anxious. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I'm going to go back to sleep. My head is alarming. So, verse 16, says, I approached one of those who was standing there, probably an angel that was standing there, seeing all of this. As he's seeing all of this, I approached one of them, and I stood there, and I asked him, what is this? What, tell me what I'm seeing. Tell me the truth concerning all this. So he told me, and he made, me, made known to me the interpretation of all of these things. What is the interpretation? Well, here's what he says. The four great beasts are four kings who shall rise out of the earth. But the saints, who are the saints? That is those who God has chosen. The saints shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever, forever, forever and ever. That's who's going to receive it. Well, what kingdom are they receiving? Well, they're receiving the kingdom of the Son of Man. The four beasts come out, they're four kings, they arise out of the earth, but the saints will be the ones that possess it forever. Then Daniel said, well, I got to know more because the fourth beast is different from all the rest. The fourth beast is exceedingly terrifying with its iron and claws of bronze. 
and which devoured in broken pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. So what is it about the beastly empire? Well, it will be exceedingly, terrifyingly great, powerful, beyond compare, powerful across this world. It doesn't mean that the entire planet is caught up in this because for God, the known area that he was always talking about was Israel and the Mediterranean, the Middle East. It doesn't mean that everybody is going to experience that, but everybody will be affected by it because this beastly empire will have an impact around the world and it will create chaos around the world. And we're going to see some of that. So Daniel says, I, I've got to know about the fourth beast. It was different. It had iron, claws, devoured, broken pieces. And then uh, what about these 10 horns that were on its head? And the other horn, this little horn that came up before which three of them fell. The horn had eyes and a mouth and it spoke great things that seemed great greater than its companions. So, so what about this? This beastly empire, what are the ten horns? What, what is the little horn that seems so much better than everybody else, than all of its companions? Daniel says, as I looked, this horn made war with the saints. Who were the saints? The followers of God. The ones who either... Two possible interpretations. Either it is Israel itself or it is the followers of Christ or it's a combination of both. It made war with the saints. If you're a saint of God, this is you being affected. And it made war and it actually prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came. And judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Now he's going to interpret it. Thus, he said, as for the fourth beast, and this is why it is a revived beast, that the iron is iron mixed with clay, that the fourth beast has been revived. Because look what he says. As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, it will be different from all the others. It will devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it into pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise. Then another shall arise after them. He will be different from the former ones and he will put down three kings. And what is he going to do? Well, it says, he will speak words against the Most High. That's blasphemy. He will speak lies against God Almighty. Speaking words that may sound good to the world or to their own religion, but goes against the Ancient of Days, the Most High. And this one who is this little horn shall wear out all the saints of the Most High. He will wear them out. And look what he says. And he will think to change the times and the law. My firm conviction, because I look at the area where all of this occurs, and it's always occurred, and I look at the people in the world that hate God's people more than anything else, whether it is the Jewish people or Christians, and it is the Muslim nations. The Muslim nations have an idea in mind that they want to change the law. Did you know that? They want to start going by a different type of law. They want to go by Sharia law. What is Sharia law? Well, the Sharia law, Sharia just simply means the clear, well-trodden path to water. And Sharia acts as a code for all living Muslims that they should adhere to, including prayer, fasting, 
donations to the poor, how to handle moral and ethical issues in life, and what kind of judgments are to be meted out if people do not meet those. You know, the LGBTQ community that is so prone now to the Muslim community, when Sharia law takes place, they will be absolutely decimated because Sharia law is a different type of law. It is not a law according to what we understand or what we know. It's a law according to what their belief systems are. And so what will the little horn do? Well, the little horn will, will speak, it says, will speak horn, speak blasphemy against God, will have power over this empire, will have so much power that they can change time and law. That this little horn will make war with the saints and will prevail against the saints. This little horn will be the leader of the nation, of the beastly nation. And look what it says. The saints, which is really here even referencing Israel itself, shall be given into his hand. So it's not a woman, apparently. It's a guy. But given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. So what does that mean? Well, this means that this person will have his way against God's nation of Israel for a time, times, and half a time. Now, what are those? Well, a time, the, the literal word time is the word um, idan in, in Hebrew, and time means one year. So he says, you, this person will have influence for a time. What is that? That's one year. Times, well, that could be two years. And then what did he say? Half a time, which is what? Half a year. Add those together, and what do you have? Three and a half years. Three and a half years, this one is going to have power over God's people for three and a half years. Have you ever heard that number before? Revelation chapter 13, verses 5 through 8. And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty, blasphemous words. Does that sound familiar? Given a mouth, uttering haughty, blasphemous words, allowed to exercise authority for how long? 42 months. Do you know what 42 months is? Three and a half years. So the book of Revelation matches up with what Daniel says and what he was seeing in his vision. This beast has power for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling. That is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain. So what does that mean? That means he is going to have influence and power. The main point of focus is going to be the Middle East, but he will have wide stretching around the world power over everyone except those whose names had been written in the book of life. And with those people whose names had been written in the book of life, he is going to war against them and he's going to prevail. So does that mean that the church is going to be here or the church is not going to be here? Well, we got a lot more weeks to go through in order to come to that point. Here, here's what I tell people. It is one of those things that you have to wrestle with because the Bible leans one way. And so here's what I tell people. Prepare for an end 
of wrath rapture, or a, a pre-wrath rapture, meaning before the wrath of God happens. Prepare yourself for that. And pray for a pre-tribulation rapture. That's what you do. That way you're not disappointed. Prepare yourself, just in case, and hope for, I'm not here. If you hope for, I'm not here, and that's what you expect, and it doesn't happen that way, you may be tempted just to give up on God. If you prepare for, I have to go through some hard times, and then you don't have to, fantastic. (laughs) It's like I studied for a test, and I didn't have to take the test, and I am so happy about that. We're going to talk a lot about that, because there's a lot of scripture, by the way, that talks all about those things. Let me go back, though. What is, the, what is the Antichrist going to do, the little horn? He's going to change the laws and the times. He's going to blaspheme. He's going to have power. He's going to dwell for three and a half years. He is going to bring terror upon that area in particular, but really he's going to have a worldwide influence, and it's going to be bad until God returns. Here's how Daniel concludes. Verse, chapter 7. But the court shall sit in judgment, and the dominion of the little horn shall be taken away, and it will be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be uh, under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. So, what does that mean? It means in the end, God is going to win. Remember this picture that we looked at earlier. The stone destroys the feet of the final empire that God wins. What is he saying here? He's saying God is going to win. As bad as it gets, as tough as it gets, as amazing as the things are that that will happen, God is going to win. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom. The final kingdom and the final dominion will be everlasting. God's will not go away. And the people will serve and obey him. So Daniel says, here's the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly alarmed me and my color changed. (laughs) But I kept the matter in my heart. Daniel was seeing something hundreds and thousands of years before it would actually happen. And we are the people that are starting to see things beginning to turn and move in the direction that for centuries people would read it and have no clue. And we're starting to say, well, this seems plausible. This seems like it's happening. We saw the rebirth of Israel. We saw the two nations become one. We saw these things beginning to unfold in our time. They're just beginning. And we have so much more that we are going to go through. So next week, we're going to go through part of Daniel, well, really the next part. Daniel chapter 8 will be pretty quick. Daniel chapter 9 is where we really get into Jacob's trouble, where he really narrows it down. And then... We're going to see this incredible prophecy in Daniel chapter 10 or 9 called the 70 weeks, which is amazing. And it's God laying out the blueprint of exactly what's going to happen. All right, let's close with a word of prayer and we'll pick it up there next time. Father God, thank you for being with us tonight. Prepare our hearts. Help us to not fear or worry but to trust you wholeheartedly, to realize that you hold all things in your hand. You're going to win. Everything will work out according to your plan. Your kingdom, your dominion will last forever. Help us to make sure that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life by trusting in you, Jesus, by accepting you in our hearts, by asking for the forgiveness that you offer and making sure that we follow you with our lives. We want our names there, Lord. There's no way that we can earn it. It is by your grace that you have forgiven. By your grace, you have redeemed us. 
and you have set us free. Lord, be with us now as we leave. Help us to go in your grace and in your peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right.